Namaskaram. So let's talk about part four of the current affairs discussion of the month of December 2023. I know that it has been too late to record this video, but I am struggling with some other problems. So from now onwards, I try to upload videos as soon as possible for each and every month from one to four parts. So in each month, I uploaded video of one and a half hour or one, one and 40 minutes of 30 questions. And in each month, there are four parts. For one week, part one. For second week, part two. For third week, part three. For fourth week, part four. Okay. And in the fifth part, I just analyze each and every question. That means in the uh, fifth part, I, uh, you can say, solve 120 question, which we talked or which we learned earlier about in part one, two, three, and four. Okay, so I hope you understand the whole concept or whole idea behind our lectures. So let's talk about fourth part of December 2023. So first question of this part is travel for life. India is a sectoral, it is a sectoral program launched by Ministry of Tourism. Remember the name of ministry. Because the name suggests travel, so ministry is sure a tourism ministry. So it is sectoral, that means section-wise, it is a sectoral program launched by Ministry of Tourism in India in collaboration with the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change and the UNWTO, not World Trade Organization, it is World Tourism Organization. Okay. So UNWTO and Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change and the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, on September 27, 2023, World Tourism Day. Okay, so on September 27, we know that we celebrate as a World Tourism Day. So on this day, Travel for Life is launched by Ministry of Tourism in collaboration with MOFCC, UNWT, and USEP. So remember, two ministry of India, Ministry of Tourism is main, collaborate with MOFCC, UNEP, and UNWT. So they launched it on a World Tourism Day, which is fallen September 27, 2023. September 27 celebrated each year. So this launched on the year of 2023. What is the aim of the initiative? The initiative aims to bring about behavioral change in both tourist and tourism businesses. Okay. Remember behavioral change. Both tourist and tourism businesses focusing on environmental protection and socio cultural sustainability. So, main aim is to empower or behavioral change in tourist and tourism businesses focusing on environmental protection and socio cultural sustainability for the protection of environment and for the sustainability of society and culture. The program also encourages tourism businesses to adopt sustainable practices and earn certificate. Certification level. It is important for the protection of the environment. So that it is important for the protection of the environment. We have to empower tourist to businesses so that they work on the protection of it, as well as government gives them certificate so that in various scheme and program they are benefited from their certificates. What are the themes of the travel for life? So theme is save energy, save water, say no to single use plastic, reduce waste, empower local businesses and community. Respect local culture and heritage, consume local foods and conserve nature. Okay. When we travel, so in Kola, tourist as well as tourist businesses have to focus on these eight themes of the life initiative. That means whatever we do, whatever we do, try to focus on saving energy, saving water, do not unnecessarily waste water, say no to single use plastic, instead we use other things, reduce waste as much as possible. Empower local business or community so that the economy of that region prosper. Respect local culture heritage so that people are protected and uh, conserve it. Consume local food so that, of course, their foods are got promoted as well as business prosper and conserve nature so that people travel, future generation travel to this region and experience the beauty of that place. So this is all about travel for life. Through this picture, you can clearly see people travel and on tourist spots, tourist spots and government empower tourist organization or tourist businesses as well as tourists to adopt sustainable promotion of sustainability of cultural heritage and protection of environment and focuses on eight initiatives of life 
like save quarter, save energy, say no to a new or no single which plastic. The conserve nature, promote local food. All these are important aims of this initiative. Let's talk about next topic called Pacific Asia Travel Association part of PATE. Remember Pacific Asia Travel Association. The PATA is partnering with the India to expand the travel for life. Travel for life means life means lifestyle of the planet for the planet and by the planet. Okay. Life means lifestyle for the planet, by the planet, and of the planet. Initiative across the Asia Pacific region. Okay, so PATA collaborate with India to spread the initiative of life across the Asia Pacific region. It is PATA is founded in 1951, remember? And it is a non for profit membership based association. Okay, it is a non not for profit membership based on association that promotes the responsible development of travel and tourism. Okay, PATA promotes the responsible development of travel and tourism in the Asia Pacific region. So, this is about PATA founded in 1951, not for profit membership or association and responsible for development of travel and tourism in the Asia Pacific region. So, PATA collaborate with India to promote the life initiative. So, remember, this is the PATA organization. Now let's talk about next topic called CTBT, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. The CTBT is a global treaty, remember, not a regional treaty, it is a global treaty adopted by the UN in 1996 aimed at prohibiting the nuclear explosion. So for the prohibition, for the restriction of nuclear explosion or for prohibiting activity related to nuclear explosion, this treaty is formed for military or peaceful purposes. Okay. So, nuclear explosion for military and or for peaceful purposes, CTBT aim is to restrict the nuclear explosion. However, it is not yet entered into force. Remember, CTBT is not entered into force due to the incomplete ratification process by several countries. Many countries are not ratified this treaty so that so this treaty is not yet come into force. The origin of CTBT can be traced back to the arm race between the UN and Soviet, uh, United States, US and Soviet Union, which conducted numerous nuclear tests from 1945 to 1996. Okay. So, at this time, when Cold War, so when there is an arm race between US and Soviet Union taking place, at that time, this treaty is formed because at that time, these two countries conducted numerous nuclear tests from 1945 to 1996, causing concern about the environmental and health impacts of radioactive fallout. Okay. Because why it is formed? So that concern related to environment and health impacts have to uh, have to be reduced or have to be contained. Various attempts to limit nuclear testing were made. There are many attempts are made to limit the nuclear testing phenomenon, including the limited nuclear test treaty in 1963. Okay. So there are many attempts taken by this organization to restrict or to limit the use of the nuclear nuclear weapons or nuclear explosions. And in that line, in 1963, a limited nuclear test ban treaty is also made. It talked about prohibit, prohibited test in the atmosphere, outer space, and underwater, but allowed underground testing. So in CTBT, they prohibit uh, explosion in atmosphere outer space and underwater but allow underground testing. So you can test your nuclear weapons or nuclear equipment underground but not underwater or in outer space or not in atmosphere. The CTBT established in 1996 sought to impose a complete ban on the explosive nuclear testing. Okay. CTBT sought to restrict or impose a complete ban on the explosive nuclear testing taking advantage of reduced geopolitical tension after the end of Cold War. So in Cold, Cold War end, CTBT look it as an opportunity to impose a complete ban on the explosive nuclear testing. Despite its adoption, some countries have conducted nuclear tests since then, including India, Pakistan, and North Korea. Okay, Many people, many countries adopted, but even after its adoption, many countries like India, Pakistan, and North Korea conducted nuclear tests after their adoption. The treaty required ratification by 44 specific countries okay, with nuclear technology. So countries who have nuclear technology like that, this treaty needed the recognition or ratification of 44 countries and eight of them, including China, 
Egypt, India, Iran, Israel, North Korea, Pakistan, and United States have yet to do so. Okay, because see, China, India, Pakistan, Asia in one region, North Korea in another region, Iran in another region, United States in another. So these eight countries are not yet rectified it, and we know that these eight countries are nuclear equipped country so when until they are not ratified it this treaty is not come into force so even after the formation even after the establishment of security these three countries are conducted their test and this treaty is not come into force because it required 40 ratification of 44 specific country who have nuclear technology and in that eight country who have making technology not yet ratified the treaty so this is all about CTBT. Remember the name, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Talk about uh, imposition of ban on the nuclear explosions or nuclear testing. Let's talk about next topic called water mill. Scientists are conducting research on water mill, the world's smallest flowering plant. So water mill is a world, remember, it is not related to energy, related to world's smallest flowering plant to expose its potential as a source of nutrition and oxygen for astronauts. So water will act as a, many scientists see it like a potential, as, potential as a source of nutrition and oxygen for astronauts. Because you know that when astronauts go into space, they are very much, uh, they are very much at their lack of oxygen in food are there. So astronauts require much of a nutritious food as well as abundance of oxygen. So many scientists see water mill as a replacement or you can say as a potential for that task. Water mill known for its tiny size and floating habitat on water bodies. Okay, size is very tiny as well as this flowering plant is floating on the water body. Offer a unique subject for this research due to simplicity and rapid growth rate. That plant it's very simple, not so complex, and its growth is also rapid. So it create a desire or you can say a curiosity in the scientist to research about this plant. It lacks roots, stems, or leaves, making it an ideal candidate for study the effect of altered gravity on plant development. Okay. This flower flowering plant lacks root, stem, as well as leaves. So it is very much suitable for the uh, space activity where scientists can use its nutrition as well as oxygen for their research. Water mill is not only scientifically intriguing but has a practical benefits. Okay, scientists are interested in it, interested in this, but apart from it, there are also practical benefit of this water mill. What are the benefit? It is a prolific producer of oxygen through photosynthesis and a rich source of protein. Okay, this plant have a abundance of oxygen as well as rich source of protein. In Thailand, it has been part of the local diet for generations. Okay, in Thailand, people use it as a food from generation. So nowadays, scientists want to use it for the, uh, use this food for astronauts so that they can go in a space and research for a longer time because through this plant, they have an abundance of food, nutrition, as well as oxygen. So the, you can clearly see in this image, this is the tiny water mill flowering plant. So this is all about this. Now let's move on to the next topic called Kane Betua Link Project KBPL. The Kane Betua Link Project KBPL, a major irrigation project in India, has secured its final forest clearance after six years. So after six years, that project got a forest clearance. The KBLP is a river interlinking project. It linked two rivers, Kane River and Betwa River, that aims to transfer sur surplus water from the Kane River in Madhya Pradesh to Betwa in Uttar Pradesh. Okay, so Kane Betwa project is a interlinking project. In, in this, the excess water from Kane River is transferred to the Betwa River. Kane River is located in MP and Betwa River is located in UP. The project is the first under the national perspective plan for interlinking of rivers. So. Under this plan, this project is a first of its kind. The KBLP aims to irrigate and irrigate the drought from Bundelkhand region. We know that when you go to the Bundelkhand region, in that region is very drought prone. So this project tries to irrigate that area so that people who are living there irrigate that field and uh, 
grow their own food as well as not suffer much from food scarcity or economic development or other daily needs. The dam will be built within Panna Tiger Reserve and will generate 103 megawatt of hydroelectric power. And this dam is built within Panna Tiger Reserve. Many environmentalists also protest about this project because they their argument is that this project is threatening the biodiversity environment of the Panna Tiger Reserve region and many species are maybe lost or uh, displaced due to this project. So in this picture, you can clearly see this is a Betwa River, this is a Cane River, this is a Panna Tiger Reserve, this interlinking project, this dam is built on this in this Panna Tiger Reserve and water surplus from Cane is transferred to Betwa. So Cane is in MP and Betwa is in UP. And this is the Bundelkhand region. People talk about uh, for the prosperous of that region or for irrigating the land of that region. This project is commenced uh, six years ago, but mm, that project got clearance, forest clearance uh, uh, recently in the month of December. Now let's talk about next point called aerosol type of colloids. There are 10 of millions of solid particles and liquid droplets in the air we inhale on daily basis. On daily basis, we inhale air. I mean, that air, there are millions of solid particles as well as liquid droplets. These ubiquitous specks of matter are known as aerosol. So these matter, which we are not able to see from the naked eye, are called aerosols. And they can be found in air over oceans, deserts, mountains, forests, ice, and every ecosystem in between. So not only in one ecosystem, in the ecosystem of ocean, in the ecosystem of desert, in the ecosystem of mountain, mountain, in the ecosystem of forest and ice. In all these ecosystems, these aerosols are found. So common examples of collides are this, like uh, fog, clouds, mist. Classification is given. If dispersed phase is liquid and dispersed medium is gas, so the type is called aerosol. Examples are fog, cloud, and mist. In the same manner, if dispersed phase is solid, dispersing medium is gas, it is also aerosol. Examples are smoke, automobile, exhaust. If dispersed phase is gas and dispersing medium is liquid, it is foam like serving cream. If dispersed phase is liquid and dispersing medium is liquid, it is called emulsion, like milk, ice cream. Okay. If dispersed phase is solid, dispersing medium is liquid, it is called soap, like milk of magnesia and mud. If dispersed phase is gas, and dispersing medium is solid, it is called also foam, like foam, rubber, sponge, humic. If dispersed phase is liquid, dispersing medium is solid, it is called gel, like jelly, cheese, butter. If dispersed phase is solid and dispersing medium is solid, it is called solid soul, like color, gemstone, and milk glass. So these are the examples of collides. Now let's talk about next topic called Indus River System. In Indus River System, you can clearly see this is the map of the Indus River System. This is the Indus River. This, this one is Jhelum, Chena, Ravu. This one is Bias. And this one is Satlaj. Okay. Satlaj from near Tibbal. Indus is also near Lake Mansarovar. But Jhelum is originating from the JK. Chena is from the Himachal. Ravi is from Bias is from Himachal. And Ravi is from Himachal. So Indus and Satlaj are from the near the Kalas Mansarovar area or near the Tibbal. Jhelum is in Srinagar, but remaining three Chenab, Ravi and Vyas are from the Himachal Pradesh. So remember the state also. One from Srinagar, three from Himachal and two from the outside of India. And in sequential order are first Indus, then Jhelum, then Chenab, then Ravi, then Vyas, then Satla. Okay. Here it is Satla. Here you can clearly see Satlaj is this river, Ravi is this, Bias is this river. When Bias met with Satlaj at this point, this after that we know this river as a Satlaj only. Okay. So in this Chelam, Chenab, Ravi, Bias, and Satlaj. In this picture, you can clearly see a Panjad region where all these five rivers, Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, Bias, and Satlaj are met. So this is very, very important. It is it is the point where all these rivers are met. This point is very, very, very important. It is called Panjad region. 
in this picture can clearly see very boldly highlighted the image of the rivers okay so you clearly see these two are outside india in tibet region of china and not tibet is autonomous region so we can call it in tibet region and jhelum is from jk uh, and chenab ravi india is from the himachal pradesh so the indus river originating in the western part of the tibet in the vicinity of mount kailas and lake mansarovar the river runs of course through northern india in ladakh into northern pakistan and then flow along the entire length of pakistan and punjab to emerge into the arabian sea near the city of thatta in sindh so near this city this river go and meet with the arabian sea so remember it is originating near in the tibet western tibet near mount kailas and lake mansarovar initially it covered the northern indian part then it covered northern pakistan but then then flow throughout the pakistan region until they until this river met with arabian sea near the city of thatta in sindh so here you can clearly see it originated from here move it originated from the western tibet move in the ladakh region of india then in the northern part of pakistan flow entirely to pakistan and then met with the arabian sea near the city of thatta in pakistan okay this picture also clearly show you that this river this is the region where it flow in ladakh region after that it entirely go into the pakistan and then met with the arabian sea the jhelum rises from a deep spring at verinag okay jhelum river which is rises from a deep spring in verinag in western jammu and kashmir union territory in the indian administered portion of the kashmir region okay so remember its origin is verinia and verinag in the western jnt the river meanders northwest from the northern slope of pir panjal range through the well of kashmir and bular lake at srinagar which control its flow okay so well of kashmir to bular lake at srinagar control the flow of the jhelum river and it meanders northward from the northern slope of pir panjal range what where is virnag virnag what is virnag virnag is a town named after the famous of the virnag spring in mughal garden near antanam anantanag city in the antanam district of the union territory of jnk so remember in the ut of jnk in antanam district there is a city called antanam city there virnag spring in mughal garden also jnk so virnag name is derived or taken from that region so in this picture can clearly see Uh, this is the Kashmir Valley, and in this river is going from Jhelum is going from this, uh, going originated from Jhelum region and flow like this this one. This one is Jhelum, so it this one is Jhelum. Its path is like that, like that, like that, and here it is originated from the. Anantanag district of J and K. Okay. Again, the path of Jhelum is shown here. In this picture, you can clearly see this is the Anantanag district. This one. I think I put many maps on it, so you can clearly see also Anantanag district is like uh, this. this one right yeah this one i think earlier i put a wrong map antanag district is like this one yeah okay so in this picture clearly see this is the antanag district where from where jhelum river is originated this is a ular lake jhelum river passes through it This is a very nice spring which I talked about. This is the Mughal Garden. Now let's talk about Chenab River. Chenab River rises in the upper Himalayan in the Lahul and Spiti district of Himachal Pradesh. So in the Lahul and Spiti district of Himachal Pradesh, this river is originated. So upper Himalaya. We talk about upper Himalaya. So this is the upper uh, Great Himalaya, also called upper Himalaya. So E. So this is the upper Himalaya. This I think both colors are same. 
So you may got confused. So let's do it in another color. So this E1 is the upper Himalayan state. So in upper Himalayan region, so in this region, in the Lahore and Spriti Valley, the Chenab, uh, not yes, the Chenab River is originated. Okay. You can clearly this see in this map that Lahore and Spiti Valley of the Himachal Pradesh from where this Chenab River is originated. Okay. So this is the Great Himal map of a Great Himalayan region. Okay, this is the Great Himalayan region. Here Lahore Lahol Spiti Valley in the Himachal Pradesh district from where Chenab River is originated. This picture is also talking about the Great Himalayan range or region. Because Chenab region is situated, originated from the Great Himalayan region. And you can clearly see in this map the Chenab River flow of Chenab River. And this is the Lahul and this is the Spiti regions. And between them, origin of Chenab is situated. Now let's talk about Ravi River. Ravi River rises in the Bara Bhangal district, Kangra in the Himachal Pradesh. This region is also originated from Himachal Pradesh, but region is different. District is different. Earlier district is Lahore Spiti. Now district is Kangra and region rises from a region called Bara Bara Bhangal Kangra district, Himachal Pradesh. So in this map you can clearly see in the below map you can clearly see region of Kangra. Okay, and from that region, Ravi River is originated. Okay, uh, yeah, this region, this river, this river, is, this river is a Ravi River. Okay, so remember the name of the district is Kangra, state is Himachal Pradesh. Okay, yeah, you can clearly this see in this map. This one, this highlighted one is the Ravi River, Origin, originated from the Kangla district of the Himachal Pradesh. Now let's talk about the Bias River. Bias is a part of the Indus River system and one of the tributary of the Indus River. And we know about the Bias originate near the Rohtang Pass on the southern end of the Pir Panjal range. Okay, so on the southern end of range of Pir Panjal range from the Rohtang Pass, this river is originated. It is a 460 kilometer in length and flows within the Indian territory. All the river is not flow within the Indian territory, but this Bias river is flow within the Indian territory. Rotang Pass, let me, this is the altitude of it, is a high mountain pass, 51 kilometer from the Manali that connect the Kulu Valley and the Lahul and Spiti Valley of Himachal Pradesh, Republic of India. So this pass is 51 kilometer from the Kulu Valley and Lahul and Spiti Valley. This is situated at a height of nearly 4,000 meters above sea level. Rotang Pass in Manali is a beautiful and very popular mountain pass enclosed in the Himalayas. So remember, Rotang Pass is very beautiful. In Manali, is a very beautiful and very popular mountain pass. It is located in the state of Himachal Pradesh. Rotang Pass is nearly 51 kilometers from the hill station of Manali. So remember, all the three rivers. Uh, Bias, okay, Bias River, Ravi River, okay, uh, Chenab, Chenab, Ravi and Bias, all three are from the Himachal Pradesh. Bias is from Rohtang Pass, Ravi is from, I think, Lahul Spiti Valley and Chenab is in the, Chenab is in the Lahul Spiti Valley, Ravi is in the Kangra district. And Bias is in the Pir Panjab range of Rotang Pass, from Rotang Pass. So remember Bias, Rotang, Ravi from the Kangra, and Chenab is from the Lahul and Spiti Valley. So all the three rivers are from the Himachal Pradesh. 
in this picture you can clearly see this is the rotang pass from where bias river is originated and all the port 30 km is within the indian territory In this map, you can clearly see the district of the Himachal Pradesh. So, Kullu, this Kullu, this is Lahul Spiti, and so from Lahul and Spiti, China, okay, from Rotang Pass, which is near this region, is Bias, and Ravi is from the uh, I think Kullu and Manali. Okay. So all these three river is from the state of Natural Pradesh. I also put the Tehsil map of Manali Kullu. So that you can clearly see Manali and Kullu are not distinct. They are Tehsil map. Now let's look at the Rotang Pass, Manali, and these two are under the Machal Pradesh. Okay, I, I, I put each and every map related to this area because this area is very, very important. Okay, this one is the Rotang Pass from where Bias River is originated. And you can clearly see this is a Kullu. So, from Kullu, Rotang Pass is nearly 51 km from Manali. Sorry, from Manali, Rotang Pass is just a minute. This black one is Manali, red one is Rotang. So, distance between them is 51 km. And Rotang Pass is very, very famous for tourists as well as for other transportation purposes. This is the Rotang Pass from Bias River. Okay. Now let's talk about Satlaj. The source of Satlaj is west of catchment area of Lake Rakshastar uh, in Tibet as spring is an ephemeral stream. What is ephemeral stream? Lake uh, Rakshastar is a salt water lake in the Tibet Autonomous Region, China, lying just west of Lake Bansarwar and south of Mount Kailas. Okay, so source of Satlaj is the west of catchment area in the Lake Rakshastar. In Tibet. The Satlaj River originated at Rakshastal's northwestern tip. When you look at the map of Lake Rakshastal, you can clearly see satellite view of Lake Mansarovar, right? So this was the Lake Mansarovar and Rakshastal with Mount Kailas in the background. And this one is the Lake Rakshastal. So in that region, Satlaj River originated from this region. So this is a satellite view of Lake Mansurvas and Rakshastar and above it in this background from Mount Kailas near Mansurvar, here from near this Satlaj River is originated. If you want to look at the course of Satlaj River, through this picture, you can clearly see the course of the Satlaj River originated from the near Kailas Mansurvan Rakshastal Lake in the Tibet region and flow in India. So remember, not all the river, uh, only river Bias is completely flow within India. Others are flow in Tibet or in Pakistan and some part of it is also flow in India. If you see the map of Brahmaputra River, you can clearly see this is the map, this is the flow of Brahmaputra River. And it Brahmaputra River has its source also in southwest Tibet. Okay. In southwest Tibet, Brahmaputra River finds its place. So this is the end of the Indus River system. Now let's talk about next topic called depleted uranium. Depleted uranium is a byproduct of the process of creating enriched uranium. Okay. 
So depleted uranium is just a byproduct when we create a process for creating enriched uranium, which is used in nuclear reactor and nuclear weapon. Depleted uranium is used in the nuclear reactor as well as in nuclear weapons, and it is a byproduct of enriched uranium. In comparison to enriched uranium, depleted uranium is much less radioactive. Okay, depleted one is less reactive, enriched one is more reactive, and is incapable and is incapable of generating a nuclear reaction. Okay, so depleted uranium is not capable of generating a nuclear reaction. However, due to its high density, it's more dense than lead. Okay, its density is very high and it is more dense than lead. Depleted uranium is widely used in weapons as it can easily penetrate armor plating. Okay, so it is not more radioactive, but it is very easily penetrate the armor plating. So we can use this. Many companies or many organizations use it in a weapons. Even though depleted uranium mutations aren't considered nuclear weapon, experts suggest that this weapon must be used with caution because they emit low levels of radiation and can cause severe disease. Although depleted uranium not start nuclear reaction but when we use it in a weapon it also emit low level of radiation and that can also cause severe disease ingesting or inhaling quantities of uranium even depleted uranium is dangerous it depresses renal function and raises the risk of developing a range of cancer okay so when any people exposed to it it is very much possible that their renal if they inhale it the impact on renal function is great as well as they are also exposed to cancer. According to International Coalition to Ban Uranium Weapons, depleted uranium mutation which miss their target can poison groundwater and soil, not only human health, and so it also poisons the groundwater and soil from which our food are emerged. So it is also important we have to use this depleted uranium for a very you can say very judiciously as well as not randomly used on all other places because it is impacting human health, soil, as well as groundwater. You can clearly see this is a picture of weapons made out of depleted uranium. Depleted uranium is capable of, you can say, spearing the plates of the armor. Next point is language movement. The language movement not only gave rise to the Bengali national identity, in the then Pakistan, but also become a stepping stone for Bengali nationalist movement. So this language movement not only gave the rise of Bengali national identity, but instead of instead of it gave Bengali national identity, but apart from it, it also uh, act as a stepping stone for Bengali nationalist movement, like six point movement, student movement in 1962, uprising in 1969, and 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War. So in the Bangladesh Liberation War, in the uprising of 1969, in the student movement of 62, and then in the six point movement, these language movement play a very important part. This is perhaps the only movement in the history that started with protecting linguistic and cultural rights and ultimately led to the birth of an independent nation, Bangladesh. Very, very important. Because earlier it is start like a protecting the linguistic and cultural rights, but it becomes so crucial if this movement becomes so advanced and so widespread that. Ultimately, it led to the birth of an independent nation for Bangladesh in 1971. Next point is Legislative Council. The chairman of the Legislative Council is elected by the council itself from among its members. So remember, chairman of Legislative Council elected among the council itself. Under Article 171 of the Constitution, the maximum strength of the council is fixed at one third of the total strength of assembly. So whatever the strength of assembly, its one third is fixed for the member of, for the maximum strength of the councils. And the minimum strength is fixed at 40 with some exception. Some exception, why? Because if any assembly, there are seats, if we divide it one third, it not, it, uh, you can say, it may come below 40. So in that case, we kept it as an exception because minimum is 40, maximum is one third of the assembly seat. So if any, if any council number of seat is less than 40 so fear so the, uh, at that place we made it as an exception and fixed it like 30 seats or 35 seats like that provided that the total number of members in the legislative council of a state cell in no can be less than 40 yeah what i talk about it 
So the maximum strength of the legislative assembly is fixed at 500 and the minimum is 16. So maximum is 500. So what? And in council, one third of the assembly seats and minimum is 40. So it is for the council. But it council seats, it depends on assembly. So in case of assembly, maximum is 500 and minimum is 60. So it means the strength, strength of assembly vary from 60 to 500 depending on the population size of the state. Okay. However, in states like Arunachal Pradesh, Goa, and Sikkim, remember, the minimum strength is fixed at 30, and in case of Mizoram and Nagaland, it is 40 and 46, respectively. We know that minimum assembly seats is minimum is 60 and maximum is 500. But in states like Arunachal Pradesh, Goa, and Sikkim, minimum is fixed at 30 because number of seats are very low. Number of seats in assembly is low. And if we if we one third it, it go below 30, but we fixed it as a 30. And in case of Mizoram and Langa line, we fixed it as a 40 and 46. Like that, in case of council, if one third is, if we do, divide the assembly seat by one third, if it is come less than 40, we fixed some number like 30, 35, so that it not go much. Let, let's say if we divide one third of the assembly seat of some region, it go like 25. So it is a very less. So many in many councils, people fixed it like 30, 35, 39, and then maximum is maximum is I think one third of the strength of the assembly. So you can clearly see, see the state with Vidhan Parishad, that means councils like Karnataka, Telangana, Andhra, Maharashtra, Bihar, and UP. So in six states, there are presence of assembly. Karnataka, Telangana, Andhra, three in south, Maharashtra also in south, Bihar, and UP in north. Next one is Saras Krim, a 35-year-old man from Man. Mandaka Uttar Pradesh was booked under the Wildlife Protection Act 1972 for illegally keeping and nursing an injured Saras crane, which name is scientific name is Bruce Antigua, he found in his village. So a man, a 35 year old man, treating a wounded Saras crane, but he is booked under the Wildlife Protection Act for illegally keeping and nursing an injured Saras crane. The Saras crane is usually found in wetlands and is the state bird of the Uttar Pradesh. Standing at 152 to 156 cm, it is the world's tallest flying bird. Remember, world's tallest flying bird is Saras crane and its length is 152, 152 to 156 cm. Under section 39 of the Wildlife Protection Act, no person is allowed to acquire or keep in his possession custody or control any wildlife which is state property. Okay. So if any wildlife is state property, you cannot keep it. And if you keep it, you are booked under the wildlife protection. If anyone does so, for example, to treat an injured bird, as in the present case, she must report it to the nearest police station or the authorized officer within 48 hours of obtaining such position. So if any person obtain any state position, state property of wildlife, so it has to within a 48 day, within 48 hours, he or she have to report it to the nearest police station or the authorized officer within the that area. Further, under section 57 of the act, if a person is found in possession, custody or control of any wildlife, the burden of proof for establishing that the possession, custody or control is not illegal is on the person. Okay, so remember, you have, it is burden on the person that he has to prove that it is not illegal, not on the police authority, not on the other officer. So it is about a very, I think, many people say it, it is negative, many people say it's positive, but in my perspective, burden of proof not on the person who possesses it, but on the authorities. Because many people keep it like for their treatment or accidentally they do not receive it, but that uh, bird or that animal is roaming in, in roaming in that region and may, many people are not aware of that this is a this bird or these animals come under the wildlife protection or the uh, you can say it 
it is a property of the state. WLPA does not allow anyone to take home an injured wild bird and keep it for months without written permission from the state's chief wildlife warden. If anyone wants to treat it and take it home for their treatment, they have to take a permission from the state chief wildlife warden. So this is the image of Saras crane and that guy treat that Saras crane because that crane is, you can say that guy found that Saras crane in their field. So he are not aware of, many people say that, I do not know, many people say that they are not, he is not knowing that it is a state property or it is a illegal to treat him or kept him in his home for one or two months. Next point is Large Hadron Collider LXC. The Large Hadron Collider LXC is three things. First, it is a large, so large that it is the world's largest science experiment. Second, it is a collider. Collider means it accelerates two beam of particles in opposite direction and it smashes them head on. Okay, like this beam of particle, this beam of particle, they come head on head and it smashes here at this point, head on collision. So it is a collider, it is a large, and third, it is a hadron. What is hadron? The LSC built by the third, these particles are head. Hadron. So, okay, so particle name of the particle is hadron. So large hadron collider. It is large. It is a particle is hadron and collider. That means two beam of particles collide and not head on head. The LSC built by the European Organization for Nuclear Research CERN is on the energy frontier of physics research, conducting experiments with highly energized particles. So it is built by CERN. And it is the it is on the energy frontier of physics research, and it conducts experiment with highly energized particles. A hadron is a subatomic particle made up of a smaller particle. So hadron is a not a atomic. It is a subatomic particle. The LSC typically uses protons, which are made up of a, made up of a quarks and gluons. So here in the case of LSC, it uses very ener highly energized particle. So they use it proton, which is made up of a quark and gluons. So through this picture, you can clearly see this is a large hadron collider. Two beam of particle collide head on head, head, head on head. It is the largest science experiment in the world, and particle use it in it is hadron. And LSC uses proton, which is made up of the subatomic particle of quarks and gluons. Next one is International Seabed Authority, ISA. The undersea mining will be conducted to extract key battery materials. Okay. Undersea mining are conducted by the people to extract the key battery materials like cobalt, copper, nickel, and magnesium from potato site rock called polymetallic nodules. So, from these potato like rocks, they extract cobalt, copper, nickel, and magnesium. These are found at a depth of 4 km to 6 km, about 2.5 miles to 3.7 miles. The Jamaica based ISA was established under the UN Convention on Law of Sea. So, UN CLOs under this, this ISA, the Jamaica based ISA is established. It holds authority over the ocean flows. Outside of its 167 member states, exclusive economic zone. So, this ISA have authority over the ocean floor outside the exclusive economic zone of 167 country. Like this, this is the India country. So this is the exclusive economic zone. This one is exclusive economic zone. So ISA have authority outside of this exclusive economic zone, not only in case of India, in case of 167 member states. So this is the logo of ISA International Seabed Authority. Next one is political equality of citizens in a democracy. A democracy cannot exist without giving some fundamental rights of citizens and to safeguard them via institutional mechanisms. Okay. So in, in case of democracy, a democracy cannot exist without giving some fundamental rights of citizens and to safeguard them via institutional mechanism. We have to make institutional and then protect the fundamental right of the people in case of democracy. 
it is essential to have laws rule that protect citizens right in case of democracy it is very essential that we have a laws and rule who can protect the citizens right political equality is one such right okay in case of fundamental rights political equality is one such right political equality of citizens refer to equal voting right equal eligibility of for public offices so these two equal voting right and equal eligibility of public offices are example of political equality of citizen in in the case of democracy without the freedom to opine express organize and protest government can turn tyrannical and authoritarian okay so it is very important that in, in democracy people have a right to opine express organize and protest this is also essential to political equality and these rights are also essential for political equality because when we opine and express and organize and protest then we have much aware about the facts about what is going on in the country and based on that we cast our vote in a most aware manner it acts as a check and balance okay so political equality acts as a check and balance so we can clearly see people different types of people who who are waiting in a line for casting their votes okay like this one is artist and this one is a house by this one is every in a democracy every man has a political equality in case of organize opine protest and cast their vote next one is vande matram the term vande matram refer to a sense of respect expressed to the motherland so it is a vande matram is a sense of respect expressed to the motherland for any country okay but in this case we are particularly talking about in the context of india in 1870 bengali novelist bankim chandra chattopadhyay wrote a song which would go on to assume a national stature okay this bande matram song is written by bankim chandra chattopadhyay later it become a national stature in club jindabad long live the revolution was first used by maulana asrat mohan in 1921 so remember bande matram bankim chandra chattopadhyay in club jindabad maulana asrat mohan do or die by mohan das karmchand gandhi while gandhi gave the calrion call of fit india the slogan was coined by yusuf mehrali a socialist and trade unionist who also served as a mayor of mumbai so fit india slogan is given by the yusuf mehrali do and die given by mk gandhi in club jindabad maulana hasrat mohan in 1921 and remember yusuf mehrali gave fit india slogan but it is used by gandhi in, in their quit india movement so this is the image of bankim chandra chatterjee who gave bande matra next one is solid waste to energy plants what are the benefit of waste to energy plants in terms of volume usually waste to energy plants incinerate 80 to 90% of waste thus helping large cities from choking due to unmanageable waste so okay so waste to energy plant incinerate 80 to 90% of the waste waste to energy generates clean reliable energy from a renewable fuel source thus reducing dependence on fossil fuel the combustion of which is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emission okay so when through waste and waste to energy we generate clean reliable energy and it also reduce the dependence on fossil fuel because we use a noble fuel source in the waste to energy generation and it is a the combustion of the which is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emission so if we combust the waste it is a contributor to waste to energy but we use it in terms of energy it reduce the dependence on fossil fuel the sometimes the residue as is clean enough to be used for some purpose such as raw material okay residue of waste is, when we convert waste to energy residue of it is so clean that ashes of the residue is so clean that we can use it as a raw material for the manufacturing cinder blocks or for road construction okay so on the one hand we you can say produce energy on the other hand we help the ashes in the manufacturing of roads and other cinder blocks some waste to energy plants convert salt water to 
potable fresh water as a byproduct of cooling process. Okay. So through waste to energy plants, some waste to energy plants convert salt water to potable fresh water as a byproduct of cooling process. So it is also one benefit. Waste to energy plant causes less air pollution than coal plant. The coal plant produce more air pollution than waste to energy plant. It is a carbon negative. What it means? Processing waste into biofuel releases considerably less carbon and methane into air than having waste decay away in landfills or the lake. Okay. When we let's say process the waste, then biofuel releases considerably less carbon and methane into the air than having waste decay away in landfills or in the lake. When we kept it as it is, then it produces more carbon than when we use it in a waste to energy plants. So it is so it is a carbon negative, less air pollution than coal, as well as it converts salt water to potable fresh water. We can use it in a road construction and manufacturing. So it is very, very these are the benefits of waste to energy plants. Now let's you can in this picture you can clearly see how we can convert waste into energy and we can manufacture brick, use in agriculture. You can also convert salt water into fresh water and other uses like in electricity, waste to energy. So electricity is the primary one. These are byproducts which is also helping in the, you can say manufacturing sector, in environment sector as well as in water production areas. Next one is pH value for the given substance. Milk of magnesia is a medium basic compound because its pH is not so high and not so low. So this milk of magnesia is a medium basic compound. Why it is medium basic compound? Because pH is not so high, not so low. The pH of milk of magnesia is 10.5. Okay. Egg white is one of the few food products that is naturally alkaline with its pH value that can be as low as 7.6 at time of lay but with increasing alkalinity as the egg ages and can reach pH 7, 9, at pH 9.2. So egg white is a naturally alkaline. Okay, initially its pH value is 7.6. We know that 7 is the center above it alkaline below it base. So naturally egg white has 7.6 but at the time of lay but increasing alkalinity the egg age ages and as age ages its alkalinity increases to 9.2. Black coffee typically has a pH of about 5 and is thus slightly acidic. So remember egg white basic black coffee acidic. Milk of magnesia medium basic because it is neither too acidic nor too basic. Medium basic that means, yeah, sorry. Medium basic means in the basic area, that means above semen, but not so basic, not so alkaline. Black coffee is acidic with a pH value of 4 to 5, depending on the beans, roasting, and brewing. Okay. It also varies. Normally, its pH value is 4, but in terms of beans, roasting, and brewing, it varies from 4 to 5. Lemon juice has a pH between 2 and 3. So, black coffee, lemon are acidic. Egg white is naturally alkaline. And milk of magnesia is a medium basic compound. Medium, that means not so high, not so low. That means not like 20, not like 2. Okay, it is medium basic. So, let me tell you, see pH value indicator, 7 is neutral, below it acidic, above bit acidic, below it basic like seawater, ammonia, bleach, lye are alkaline, battery acid, lemon, vinegar or acid. Next one is free and open Indo-Pacific FOIP. Japan dollars 75 billion plan for a free and open Indo-Pacific to work with country in the region on so Japan has just dollar seventy five billion plan for free and open Pacific. They work in the area of avoiding debt traps like Sri Lanka fall under the debt trap of China. So avoiding that types of situation, 
building infrastructure in developing country and enhancing marine maritime and air security so in these three areas japan free and open pacific work you can clearly see and these are the indo pacific region and in that area in terms of avoiding debt trap building infrastructure and enhance maritime and air security next one is election commission the election commission told the supreme court that the offering freebies either before or after election is a policy decision of a political party okay that means offering freebies before or after election is a political decision of political party policy decision of political party said by the election commission to the supreme court and it cannot regulate state policy and decision taken by the party Le election commission said that it cannot regulate the state policy and decision taken by the party the election commission cannot regulate state policy and decision which may be taken by the winning party when they form the government so it is the argument of election commission to supreme court the ec clarified that it does not have power to deregister de political party except on three grounds election commission also bound with some restriction election commission cleared that it had, does not have a power to deregister de political party except on three grounds these three grounds are first registration obtained on fraud and forgery if they got a registration obtained on fraud and forgery second party seems to have faith and allegiance to the constitution third any other alike grounds so on these three grounds election commission has a has a role has a jurisdiction to register the political deregister the political party otherwise if government state government give freebies before and after election or you can say election commission cannot regulate the state policy or you can say election commission cannot regulate state policy and decision which may be taken by winning party when they form the government so you can clearly see this is the election commission office and these are the argument of argument of election commission in supreme court regarding political parties freebie issues Now let's talk about next topic called Vasudev Kutumbakam. The phrase Vasudev Kutumbakam is made up of three Sanskrit words. Vasudha, that means earth and world. Eva means life. Kutumbakam means large extending family. That means earth or world life, large extended family. It's called Vasudev Kutumbakam. The word spite finds mention in Maha Upanishad 6.72 and is further referred to the Hito Padesa referred to in the Hito Padesa and other literary works in India. So remember, this word find its mention in Mahaupanishadha, volume 6.72, and further referred in the Hito, Hito Padesa and other literary work in India. So remember, its name comes from three Vasudha, Eva, and Kudumbakam. Earth or world, Eva means life, family, or extended family. So earth like extended family is called Vasudha Kudumbakam. Its mention is in Maha Upanishad of 6.72 and also mentioned in Hito Padesa. So, this is the logo of Vasudev in the book World is One Family. World Life One Family. Next one is Territorial Army TA. What is TA? The Indian Territorial Army established in 1949 is an auxiliary military organization of the Indian Army. So, remember, Territorial Army is an auxiliary military organization of the Indian Army, often requested by ministries and state government for various roles okay so ministry and various state government requested these ta army for their various roles including plantation drives petroleum supply oil exploration and protection of critical infrastructure so for protecting critical infrastructure for oil exploration for petroleum supply and for plantation drive many state and ministry requested the deployment of Indian Territorial Army. The primary role of TA is to relieve and regular army from static duty and assist civil administration in dealing with natural calamity and maintenance of essential services and provide units for the regular army as and when required. So if let's say war happen, so if more army is required, TA go into that part and also relieve and regular army from static duties and Relieve the regular army, sorry, relieve the regular army from static duties. It work on the place of the regular army whenever required. 
and assist civil administration in dealing with natural calamity like the disaster happen like uh, what I can say earthquake, volcano, tsunami, this type of thing, and maintenance of essential services like protection of some important area or plantation drive or oil exploration services. The TA has participated in all of the India's wars since the country's independence. So it assists the military as well as work demanded by many state and ministry for other works. So this is the image of territorial army. Okay, it is an auxiliary arm of the Indian army. Next, Asian Games. The Asian Games, also known as ACR, is a major continental multi-sport event held every four years. Remember, ACR is held every four years and it is a major continental multi-sport event featuring athletes from across Asia. As the name suggests, not from other continent, it is athletes from the Asia participating in this event and it is held every four years. The game were initially regulated by the Asian Games Federation, AGA, from 1951 to 1978. Since 1982, they, they have been organized by the Olympic Council of Asia, OCA, after the dissolution of the AGA. So earlier, Asian Games Federation organized it, but from 1982, AGA has dissolved and another organization called Olympic Council of Asia, OCA, organized it. These games are recognized by the International Olympic Committee, IOC recognized this and are considered the second largest multi-sport event globally following the Olympic Games. Okay, so Olympic Games is first largest multi-sport event, SCRD is second largest. Israel has been excluded from the Games since 1976, the region cited as being due to security reasons. Okay, due to security region, Israel is now participated in SCR since 1976. Israel requested to participate in the 1982 Games but the request was rejected by the organization due to the Munich massacre. India held the first and ninth edition of the Asian Games in New Delhi in 1951 and 1982. So remember, India held Asia two times, first in 1951, second in 1982. And 1951 is the first one, and 1982 is the ninth one. Israel request, but its request is declined due to Munich massacre. We know that a very famous incident. You called it as infamous, called it famous, or you can just call it an unfortunate massacre. India has consistently ranked in the top 10 in medal tally except in 1990 So all the time India ranked under top 10 except 1990 games. India has won at least one gold medal in all the Asian games held till now. Okay. So at least more than one, but at least one gold medal in all the Asian games. So these are the images of people who won medals in the Asian Games. Next one is habitat rights. The Baga PBTG, Baga particularly vulnerable tribal group in Chhattisgarh has been granted habitat rights, making it the second PBTG to receive such rights in the state. Earlier, there is one more community from that state which got the uh, called habitat rights. Okay. Kamer. So Kamer and Baiga tribe of Chhattisgarh. Earlier one is Kamer, now is Baiga. So these two community, these two PBTG group, Kamer and Baiga of Chhattisgarh got the habitat right and Bharia PBTG in Madhya Pradesh also got habitat right. So till now three tribal community got the habitat rights. One is from Chhatt Madhya Pradesh and two is from Chhattisgarh. Madhya Pradesh one is Bharia, Chhattisgarh one is Kamer and Baiga. So and out of 75 PBTG in India, only three have received habitat rights. Okay, I talk about it. What are the habitat rights? Habitat rights are granted under the Forest Right Act, FRA, and provide community with rights over there. And this habitat right provide community rights over customary territory, cultural practices, livelihood means, biodiversity knowledge, and protection of their natural and cultural heritage. So all these facilities are provided under habitat rights. They can protect their livelihood, their culture, their customary territory, as well as biodiversity knowledge and protect their natural and cultural heritage. Habitat rights help safeguard traditional livelihoods and ecological knowledge, and they empower PBTG community to access government scheme and initiative to develop their habitat. So there are very much more benefit in if any community, if any tribal community recognized under any PBTG community recognized under habitat rights. So these are benefits which are mentioned here. 
So this is a tribal community which got habitat rights and take benefit of government scheme for the development of their region. Next point, PVTG. Who are PVTG? PVTG are subclassification of scheduled tribe in India. We know that SC, ST. So subclassification of ST is PVTG. They are considered more vulnerable than regular scheduled tribes. Okay. So there are more vulnerable than ST. That's why we categorize them into PVTG. PVTG are characterized by declining or stagnant population. If their population is declined or stagnant, they are categorized under it. Low level of literacy, pre-agriculture level of technology, like they are not using modern technology, not modern even pre-agriculture. When agriculture development takes place, uh, pre of that agriculture development, they use technology or economically backward. So literacy is low, economically backward, population is declining as well as you can say pre-agriculture level technology use. So if these four things are followed, we categorize that community under PVTG. The GOI, Government of India, renamed Primitive Tribal Group, PTG, as PVTG in 2006. So earlier name is not PVTG, earlier name is Primitive Tribal Group, but now particularly Vulnerable Tribal Group. Renaming is take place in 2006. The Dever Commission, remember the name, the Dever Commission created the PTG category in 1973. So in 1973, Dever Commission categorized this community as a PTG and in 2006, we changed its name from primitive tribal groups to particularly vulnerable tribal groups. So these are the PVTG community. This is the image of one of the PVTG communities. Next one is periodic labor force survey PLFS. The labor force participation rate LFPR is a measure of proportion of a country's working age population that is actively engaged in the labor force. Remember, actively engaged, not seeking. Okay, proportion of country working age population actively engaged in the labor market. An increasing trend in LFPR for person aged 15 years and above was observed. Okay. So there is some data about LFPR of person aged 15 years. First, in rural area, LFPR increased from 50.7% to 2017-80 to 16.8% in 2022-23. In rural area, LFPR increased from 50.7% to 60.10%. In urban area, it increased from 47.6% to 50.4%. That means here, very large increase here, also increased but not so huge. LFPR for males in India increased for 75.8% to 78.5%. Also increased but not so much. But for females, LFPR increased 23.3% to 37%, a huge jump. So remember, in all rural, urban, male, female, in all, LFPR is increasing from 2017-18 to 2022-23, but in rural, jump is higher than urban, and in female, jump is higher than male. So, these are images of periodic labor force survey, PLFS. Okay, remember, in rural, increase. In women, increase. In urban, increase, but not so much. Men, increase, but not so much. And year is 2017-18 to 2023-24. Now, 2022-23. Next point is carbon neutrality. Carbon neutrality referred to achieve net zero carbon dioxide emission. Okay, carbon neutrality means we have to achieve net zero carbon dioxide emission by balancing carbon dioxide emission with removal, often through carbon offsetting or simply eliminating carbon dioxide emission altogether. Either we can balance it, balance carbon dioxide emission with removal, through removal, we can balance it or eliminate completely the emission of carbon dioxide. By this through method, we can neutralize the carbon. Okay, how through removal? The process is through carbon offsetting. And emission altogether means transition to the post-carbon economy. If we transit, trans, if transition takes place in the post-carbon economy, that means we eliminate the carbon dioxide. And if we adopt the method of carbon offsetting, that means carbon emission, we reduce balance the carbon emission through removal. Although both renewable and non-renewable energy, both produce a carbon emission in some form, renewable energy has a lesser to almost zero carbon emission. So both renewable as well as non-renewable energy produce carbon di carbon emission. Not only non uh, renewable, not only non-renewable, renewable also produce, but its amount is very very low than renewable than non-renewable. Sorry. So it is lesser to almost zero carbon emission. So if a uh, statement says that renewable source not produce CO2, it is wrong. Renewable as well as non-renewable both produce, but 
emission from renewable is very less or close to zero. So through this picture, you can clearly see carbon offsetting or carbon elimination by transition is to post carbon economy or carbon offsetting. Next one is rare disease. What are rare disease? Rare disease, as the name suggests, are conditions that affect very few people. The WHO defines it as any debilitating lifelong disease or disorder, any debilitating lifelong disease or disorder with a prevalence of 10 or less per 10,000. If its prevalence is 1 or 10, as per 10,000, we categorize that disease under the rare disease. Other countries follow standards ranging between 1 and 10 cases per 10,000 to define a condition as rare disease. Okay, so according to WHO, 10 or less than per 10,000 is categorized. Other countries take it as a 1 to 10. Both are almost same. There are about 7,000 to 8,000 conditions globally that have been defined as rare disease. So there are these number of conditions which are defined under the rare disease category. The landscape of rare disease keeps changing. Its landscape is keep changing with newer condition being identified and reported constantly. Okay, there is not a fixed landscape. Its landscape is changing and they constantly people report it and newer conditions are identified under it. With limited experience of these diseases, they are extremely difficult to diagnose and more difficult to test. Okay, because its experience is very limited, so it is very hard for any human being or any, you can say, professional to detect it, test it or diagnose it. Why are drugs for rare disease are so expensive? First reason, not profit for companies as well as many people do not want to make research and development in these areas because there are very few people are affected by it. So even though there has been developments in the treatment of rare disease in the recent year, almost 95% of the condition do not have a specific treatment. So remember, almost 95% of the condition do not have a specific treatment. Recent year developments are take place for the treatment of rare disease, but not very significant. With a very small number of people suffering each of the 7,000 to 8,000 rare conditions, they do not make a good market for drugs. I talk about it. Market is not good for the drugs, so people do not want to invest their money into that area. This is the reason most pharmaceutical companies are reluctant to spend on research for treatment of the disease. Because few, people are few, money required in, in case of research and development is very huge, so companies not get profit and so they are reluctant to waste money in that area. The most commonly reported rare disease include primary immunodeficiency disorder. It is a kind of a rare disease. In this disease, a genetic condition that impairs the immune system. Okay, in primary immunodeficiency disorder. Primary immunodeficiency disorder, a genetic condition that impairs the immune system. Okay, so in this, just a minute. In primary immunodeficiency disorder, immune system is affected. In lysosomal storage disorder, a group of metabolic disorder that led to a buildup of toxic material in the cells. So in the cells, toxic materials are built up and it is a group of metabolic disorder. Name is lysosomal storage disorder. It is a kind of rare disease. Next one is small molecule inborn error of metabolism. A large group of genetic condition where the genetic code of metabolic enzyme are defective. Okay, so if genetic code of metabolic enzymes are defective, it is a kind of a rare disease. Name is a small molecule inborn error of metabolism. Next one is cystic fibrosis. It is a condition that severely damages the lung, leading to the need of transplant. It is also a rare disease. Next one is osteogenesis imperfect, a condition where bones fracture easily. Okay, so osteogenesis imperfect is a rare disease in which bones fracture very easily. A certain form of muscular dystrophy uh, and spinal muscular atrophy are also come under the rare disease category. So these are the name of rare disease like lysosomal storage disorder, small molecule inborn error of metabolism, cystic fibrosis, osteogenesis imperfect, muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy. So through this image you can clearly see on rare disease day this image is 
circulated by many people or many organizations adopt this as a symbol of rare disease. Next point is, next topic is McMahon line. The McMahon line serves as the de facto. Something exists even though it may not be legally accepted or existing. De facto means something exists even though it may not be legally accepted or existing. So McMahon line serves as a de facto boundary between China and India in the eastern sector. Okay, when you look at the map, you can clearly see in the eastern sector, this red one is a McMahon line. It is specifically represent the boundary between Arunachal Pradesh and Tibet from Bhutan in the west and Myanmar in the east. So remember, Bhutan in the east, Myanmar in the west, and it is a boundary between the Arunachal Pradesh and Tibet. The McMahon line was drawn during the Simla Convention of 1914. So during, during, in 1914, during the Simla Convention, this line is drawn. So remember, it is a de facto boundary between China and India in the eastern sector. And it is a, uh, you can clearly see, it is specifically a boundary between Arunachal and Tibet. In east, there is Bhutan and in west, there is, in east, there is Myanmar and in west, there is Bhutan. Okay. Next one is tribunals. So, what is the difference between court of law and tribunals? First difference, the court of law is a part of the traditional judicial system whereby judicial powers are derived from the state. Okay, so in court of law, judicial power is derived from the state and it part of the traditional judicial system. But in tribunal, it is an administrative tribunal and it is an agency created by the statute and invested with judicial power. So it is a traditional part of the judicial system. Court of law is a part of the judicial system, but tribunal is created through the statute. Second, the civil court has judicial power to try all sorts of a civil nature unless the cognizance is expressly or implied, uh, impliedly barred. So civil court have a judicial power to try all sorts of a civil nature. But tribunal is also known as the quasi-judicial body. Tribunal have the power to try cases of special matter which are conferred on them by statutes. So under statute, if any matter is given to them, then they are work on it. But civil courts have a judicial power to try suits of all civil nature. So this is a difference. Judges of the ordinary court of law are independent of the executive in respect of their tenure, terms, and condition of service. A judiciary is independent of executive in terms of court of law. In terms of tribunal, tenure, terms, and condition of the services of the member of administrative tribunal are entirely in the hands of the executive okay so court of law is independent of the executive but tribunal is completely in the hand of the executive next the presiding officer of the court of law is trained in law but preside, president or the member of the tribunal may not be trained as well as as well in the law he may be an expert in the field of administrative matter so these are very major difference first uh, these are part of the traditional judicial system they are created by the statute, they, they power to suit, try of try all sorts of a civil nature, but they have a limited power, which is derived from the statute. It, it is court of law. In case of court of law, it is independent of executive, but uh, tribunal is completely in the hand of executive. And uh, court of law trained under the, uh, you can say, court of, uh, they court of, in case of court of law, they are trained under law but they are not necessary. They may be expert of the administrative matters. So these are the difference of court of law and tribunal. Very important. Next one is Martin Sun Temple. Around 1200 years ago, a great king built a grand temple dedicated to Martin the Sun God. So remember 1200 years ago, a king built the temple of Sun God in Martin. The temple survives partially today in JNK Anantana. So in this district, this temple survives partially. It, will, it still makes for an impressive sight with the formidable gray walls standing stark against the blue sky, broken gray fragment is true around the green grass. So we we'll clearly see the images. Okay, a grand sun temple in the Martin of Antanang district of JNK. Okay, very huge walls and their fragments are distributed on the green grasses. Some of the walls bear clear, clear carving of deities and the beauty and symmetry of the temple are still amply evident. Okay, 
So very beautiful carving as well as symmetry of temple is very astonishing. The temple is ringed by a row of pillars. Like this, this is a temple. It is ringed by a row of pillars. The peristyle common in Kashmiri temple architecture. And this feature is very common in Kashmiri temple architecture. The Martin temple was built by the Karkota dynasty king Lalit Aditya Mukta Pida, who ruled Kashmir from 725 AD to 753 AD. So this temple is built by the Karkota dynasty king called Lalit Aditya Mukta Pida, and he ruled the Kashmir from 725 AD to 753 AD. Dedicated to Vishnu Surya, the Martin temple has three distinct chambers. This temple has three distinct chambers. First, Mandapa then Garbhagriha, then Antralaya. Probably the only three chambered temple in Kashmir. Okay, in Kashmir there are many temples, but this temple is, is the only temple which has three chambers like Garbhagriha, Mandapa, Garbhagriha and Antralaya. The temple is built in a unique Kashmiri style, though it is, has definite Gandhar influence because you know that Kashmir is near the Afghanistan and in Afghanistan there is influence of uh, in, uh, in Kashmir, there is influence of Afghanistan because Afghanistan is very near to it. And, okay, and Gandhar is located in Afghanistan. So, it is temple is a unique Kashmiri style, but it has some influence of Gandhar architecture also. So, clearly see the Martin Sun Temple of Anantanag district of JNK. Mm -hmm. Images of deities, three, you can say, what is it, three? Three chamber temple, okay. Mandapa, Antra, Garbhagriha, and Antralaya, and influence of Gandhara art also shown here. Next one is bioremediation. What are the advantages of bioremediation? Bioremediation offers numerous advantages over other cleanup methods. What is it? By relying solely on natural process, it minimizes damage to ecosystems. I talk about bioremediation. Okay. Bioremediation often takes place underground where amendments and microbes can be pumped in order to clean up contamin uh, contaminants in groundwater and soil. Okay. So, below the ground, through bioremediation, microbes clean the contamination of groundwater and soil. Consequently, bioremediation does not disrupt nearly communities nearby communities as much as other cleanup methodology. Okay. So it is very important because it is an underground process, clean up the contaminants of groundwater and soil, and it takes place where amendments and microbes can be pumped. It not affect the nearby community as much as other cleanup methodology. The bioremediation process creates relatively few harmful byproducts. Other may product, other may produce uh, harmful byproduct, but bioremediation relatively few produce very few harmful byproducts mainly due to the fact that con contaminants and pollutants are converted into water and harmless gases like carbon dioxide. Through bioremediation, byproducts are like water and carbon dioxide which are not harmful. Finally, bioremediation is cheaper than most cleanup methods because it does not require substantial equipment or labor. Okay, so bioremediation does not require substantial equipment and labor. So it is, you can say more cheaper than other bio, other cleaning, cleanup methods. So this is the bioremediation process. You can clearly see our earth become clean through bioremediation technique. This is image shown like that. Okay. Uh, just a minute. Now let's talk about the next topic called labor force participation rate LPR. The LPR is a measure of the proportion of the country's working age population that is actively engaged in the labor market. I talk about it in the above, uh, topic also. The unemployment rate is the percentage of unemployed worker in the lab, total labor force. So in the, in the total labor force, how many people are unemployed? How many percentage of people are unemployed called the unemployment rate, okay? People who are actively engaged in labor market is called LPR, labor force participation. The labor force 
the labor force include all people who are employed and unemployed. So remember, there's a very, uh, you can say, there's a very acute difference between the total labor force and labor market. Okay, labor force include all people who are employed and unemployed, but labor market only for employed. Okay. <laughs> The unemployment rate is calculated by dividing the number of unemployed people by the total labor force. So when we divide number of unemployed from total labor force, it comes as an unemployment rate. So here three keywords, unemployment rate, labor force participation, and to labor force, and total labor force. So labor force participation is actively engaged in the labor market. Labor force, both employed and unemployment, and unemployment rates, unemployed divided by total labor force. Okay. So in total labor force, there are both unemployed as well as employed. But in labor market, there are only employed. So this is a picture of labor force participation or LPR, LFPR, not LPR, LFPR. Next one is a help initiative. The Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairy, Government of India introduced the A help. A help means accredited agent for health and extension of livestock production program. A help means accredited agent for health and extension of livestock production program. So, Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairy, GOI, introduced this A help. This program aims to empower women by engaging them as accredited agents who play a vital role in disease control, animal tagging, and livestock insurance. Okay, so under this program, this program empowers women to work in the vital role like disease control, animal tagging, and livestock. The A Help initiative is being implemented by various Indian states and union territory. So this initiative is implemented by various state and union territory like. Bihar, Gujarat, JNK, Karnataka, MP, Uttarakhand, Jharkhand, through an MOU between the Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairy and the National Rural Livelihood Mission NRLA. So, this is MOU between this state and Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairy and NRLA. Many states and UTs are implementing this scheme. The new scheme would enhance access to veterinary services at a farmer's doorstep and empower Pasu Sakhij. Okay. So this is related to animal husbandry, a help initiative, empower women, as well as access to veterinary service at a farmer's doorstep. So this is all about a help. Next topic is global amphibian assessment. The second global amphibian assessment conducted by over 1,000 experts and analyzing 8,011 species worldwide has revealed that the elusive dancing frog of the Western Guard we will use the dancing frog on western are one of the most threatened amphibian genre. So, a study shows that elusive dancing frog of the western guard is the one of the most threatened amphibian genre. This assessment points out 41% of amphibian species are on the brink of extinction globally. So, remember this data as well as name of the frog and region. And this extinction is due to climate change, habitat loss, disease, fire, invasive species, and over exploitation. Okay, so due to climate change, this species is affected due to habitat loss. If any disease is spread, if fire broke out, if invasive species threaten that region, or if people over exploit that region, these are posing significant threat to them. The dancing frog genus Microzellus, which is part of the endemic family. Microgelidia is identified as the most threatened frog genus in India. So, this dancing frog genus, this dancing frog is genus is Microgelus and its, it, its family is Microgelidia is identified as the most threatened frog genus in India. Amphibians are currently the second most declining taxa globally after coral. So, coral is the on top spot. And if you maybe use second, uh, second spot in terms of most declining taxa globally. 
making their conservation a matter of great concern. So remember, dancing from Western Ghat region, 41% amphibious are declined. Region are disease, fire, invasive stage, over exploitation, habitat loss, climate change. And these are the regions where amphibians are found. Number of species, more the rate, more the species. So blue one is less. Light blue is more than that. More light blue, more than that. Then green, more than that. Light, light green, more than that. Then green, more than that. In this manner, it is spread. So this region has more amphibians. This region has more amphibians. This region has more amphibians. Red one region has more amphibians. Next point is Tanzania. Tanzania is an East African country. When you look at the map in East Africa, you find a country called Tanzania, known for its vast wilderness area. This country has a vast wilderness area. They include the plains of Serengeti National Park, which is famous, which is populated by the big five animals like elephant, lion, leopard, buffalo, and rhino. These are big five animals. And Kilimanjaro National Park, home to Africa's highest mountain. So in Tanzania, plain of, plains of Serengeti National Park is situated as well as Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro National Park is also situated. And Kilimanjaro is famous for Africa's highest mountain. And Serengeti is famous for the big five animals. So if when you look at the map, you can clearly see through this map, you can clearly see this is the Tanzania. This is a map of Tanzania country. And here you can clearly see Serengeti National Park and Plains. It is a famous for big five animals. And uh, then Kilimanjaro National Park, which is situated here, which is Africa's highest mountain, Kilimanjaro Mountain. So this is all about Tanzania and it is situated in the Eastern Africa region. This is the Serengeti National Park. This is an image for the Serengeti National Park. And this image is for the Kilimanjaro National Park. This is the Kilimanjaro mountain, Africa's highest mountain. Okay, so this country is very famous for this for these two natural resources. Next one is hemochro hemochromatosis. Hemo Chromatosis. Hemochromatosis is a rare genetic disorder characterized by iron overload, which can lead to severe dysfunction in various organs. Due to iron overload, it causes severe dysfunction in various organs, and it is a rare genetic disorder. Hemochromatosis is a rare genetic dis disorder characterized by iron overload, which can lead to severe dysfunction in various organs. There are two main types of hemochromatosis. First, hereditary, second, and second, secondary hemochromatosis. First one is hereditary hemochromatosis. Second one is secondary hemochromatosis. What are the features of it? Hereditary homochromatosis. This genetic disorder results from mutation in HFE gene, causing individuals to absorb excessive iron from their diet. So in hereditary, individuals consume absorb excessive iron from their diet, okay? And it will take place due to mutation in HF, HFE gene. Unlike the body's natural ability to regulate iron intake, people with hereditary homochromatosis accumulate iron gradually in their system, which can lead to health problems over time. The excessive iron can affect vital organs such as liver, heart, and pancreas, potentially causing cirrhosis, heart failure, diabetes, and arthritis. So these are the features of the uh, hereditary hemochromatosis. Secondary hemochromatosis, this type is typically caused by external factor like frequent blood transfusion, excessive iron supplementation or certain medical condition. So first one is hereditary, second one is secondary. In hereditary, it is a mutation of uh, some genes. And in secondary, it is due to external factor. Iron accumulation in secondary hemochromatosis can be more rapid and lead to organ dysfunction. So in secondary, iron, iron accumulation is more rapid than the hereditary. So through this picture, you can clearly see healthy liver and iron overload liver. And this is due to hemochromatosis. 
apoptosis. This is the iron overload in the blood. This image shows the iron overload in the blood, which affect the you can say very failure of many organs in the human body. Next one is natural rubber. So natural rubber is a polymer of isoprene. It is a polymer of isoprene. Natural rubber is a polymer of isoprene and or isoprene, an organic compound and obtained from the latex of a number of tropical trees of which para rubber tree, Hiva, whose scientific name is Hiva brasiliensis is the most important. So natural rubber is a polymer of isoprene. Isoprene is an organic compound and obtained from the latex of number of tropical trees of which para rubber tree is the most important. So remember it. Natural rubber is a polymer of isoprene. It is an organic compound and obtained from the latex of the number of tropical trees of which para rubber tree is most important. Remember the name of para rubber tree. Remember the name of the polymer as well as region tropical trees. What is the age of the natural rubber? Around 33 years in plantation soil, well drained and well weathered soil. Example, laterite type, alluvial type, sedimentary type. What are the conditions of precipitation and temperature and evenly distributed rainfall with at least 100 rainy days a year with a temperature range of about 20 to 34 degrees. Okay, so temperature range is 20 to 34 degrees Celsius. Rainfall at least 100 rainy days. Soil is laterite alluvial, age is 32 years. Condition is a humidity of around 80%, 2000 hours of sunshine and absence of strong wind. So these are conditions under which natural rubber is grown. Usage of natural rubber is, natural rubber is preferred over synthetic rubber. Okay, so natural rubber is preferred over synthetic rubber due to its high tensile strength and vibration dampening properties along with tear resistance. So there are three properties which make it important over the synthetic rubber due to high tens tensile strength, vibration dampening property and tear resistance property. So world major producers of natural rubber are Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Southeast Asia country and India. In India, Kerala over 75% then Tamil Nadu and then Karnataka. India fifth largest producer and second largest consumer of natural rubber. India currently meets 40% of its requirement through import. Remember, India is the fifth largest producer and second largest consumer. An important country of important country of natural rubber producer of Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and India. So this is all about natural rubber. You can there are other property. Rubber Research Institute is under the rubber board. Remember. Rubber Board of India established 1995 headquarters in Kotayam, Kerala. Because Kerala is the largest producer of rubber in India, that's why this board is established there. The board under Ministry of Commerce and Industry is responsible for the development of rubber industry in India. So this board is the responsible for development of rubber industry in India. Headquarters in Kerala established in 1955 and come under the rubber, rubber Science Institute, RRI, come under the rubber board. What are polymers? A polymer is any of a class of natural or synthetic substance composed of very large molecules called micromolecule, which are multiple of simple chemical units called monomers. So from monomers, a multiple of simple chemical units called monomers, micromolecules are forms and large molecules composed of very large molecules form polymer. So first one is monomers, then micromolecules, then polymers. So polymer is a combination of macromolecule, which is a combination of monomers. So, so in this picture, you can clearly see neighbor natural rubber is extracted from the latex of tropical trees. Now let's talk about next topic. This is also a natural rubber extraction technique. People cut the tree natural rubber is flowing through and they collect it in a bowl like uh, bowl like uh, object here this process is taking place like on all the tree here 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 they collect natural rubber 
रिमेंबर द कंडीशन अंडर विच इट इज ग्रोन ओके टू थाउजेंड डेज रेनी हंड्रेड डेज रेन टू थाउजेंड डेज सन लाइट हंड्रेड डेज रेन टेम्परेचर ट्वेंटी फाइव टू थर्टी डिग्री ओके नो हायर विंड्स सो दीज आर कंडीशन फॉर द ग्रोथ ऑफ नेचुरल रबर नेक्स्ट वन इज वेरियस ऑपरेशन बाय इंडियन गवर्नमेंट इंडिया हैज इनिशिएटेड ऑपरेशन अजय टू इवेक्युएट इट सिटीजन फ्रॉम कॉन्फ्लिक्ट स्ट्राइक इजराइल सो फ्रॉम इजराइल इंडिया इवेक्युएट इट सिटीजन अंडर द ऑपरेशन अजय मिशन दिस मार्क द सेकेंड इवेक्युएशन ऑपरेशन ऑफ द ईयर फॉलोइंग द ऑपरेशन कावेरी विच ब्रॉड बैक इंडियन सिटीजन फ्रॉम सुडान अर्लियर सो फ्रॉम सुडान इंडियन गवर्नमेंट इक्वेट पीपल अंडर द ऑपरेशन कावेरी फ्रॉम इजराइल ऑपरेशन अजय सो रिमेंबर द नेम ऑपरेशन अजय फॉर इजराइल ऑपरेशन कावेरी फ्रॉम सुडान सो देर आर वेरियस ऑपरेशन कंडक्टेड बाई द इंडियन गवर्नमेंट फॉर एवेक्यूशन पर्पज देर आर सम लिस्ट लाइक ऑपरेशन दोस्त इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी थ्री टर्की सीरिया अर्थक्वेक वन अर्थक्वेक टेक प्लेस इन टर्की एंड सीरिया गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इक्वेट पीपल अंडर द ऑपरेशन दोस्त अंडर ऑपरेशन गंगा टेंशन बिटवीन रशिया एंड यूक्रेन वंदे भारत फॉर कोविड नाइन्टीन पेंडेमिक ऑपरेशन समुद्र सेतु अंडर कोविड इन टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी कोविड नाइन्टीन पेंडेमिक इवेक्यूशन फ्रॉम ब्रसल्स इन टू थाउजेंड सिक्सटीन वेन टेरिस्टिक स्ट्राइक टेक प्लेस ऑपरेशन राहत इन टू थाउजेंड फिफ्टीन वेन कॉन्फ्लिक्ट इन यमन एंड ऑपरेशन मैथ्री इन टू थाउजेंड फिफ्टीन वेन नेपाल अर्थक्वेक है सो रिमेंबर द नेम रिमेंबर द ईयर एज वेल इवेक्यूशन प्रोसेस In 2011, under Operation Safe Homecoming, when conflict in Libya took place, under Operation Sukun in 2006, when conflict in Lebanon took place, and in 1990, Kuwait airlift and invasion by Kuwait by Iraq. So these are important, uh, you can say, operations by Indian government. Kuwait airlift when invasion of Kuwait by Iraq took place. Sukun for Lebanon. Okay, Sukun Lebanon. Kuwait airlift for Israel. Uh, for uh, you can say when Iraq. Attack Iraq, safe homecoming Libya, Maitri Nepal, Rahat Yemen, Brussels terror attack took place, Samudra Setu pandemic, Bharat Bande Bharat pandemic, Ganga tension between Ganga I think tension between Russia and Ukraine and those Turkey Syria earthquake. So Russia Ukraine is very important for Ganga operation Ganga is for the Russia and Ukraine, Turkey Syria earthquake for those. and all others are for various other purposes so remember the name of all these operation so these are indian army combating a battle in different operations next one is green hydrogen in august 2023 the union ministry of new and renewable energy government of india provided a definition for green hydrogen specifying it has having a well to get emission in compassing water treatment electrolysis gas purification drying and compression of hydrogen not exceeding 2 kg co2 equivalent per kg h2 so what is green hydrogen okay so government ministry of renewal new and renewable energy provide definition of green hydrogen and it is like in this process if co2 not exceeding 2 kg 2 kg equivalent to per h2 If this criteria meet, then we categorize as a green hydrogen. It is specifying having a well to get emission, and it this well to get emission, it means encompassing water treatment, electrolysis, gas purification, drying, and compression of hydrogen. So well to get emission is like this, and green hydrogen, uh, you can say satisfy the criteria of two kg CO two equivalent per kg H two. In contrast, grey hydrogen. On an average, we ten kg of CO two per kg of H two produce. Okay, so when one kg of H two produce in green hydrogen, ten kg of CO two produce. But in in grey hydrogen, ten kg of CO two produce for the production of one kg of H two. But in green hydrogen, one kg of H two produce by just emission of two kg of CO two. So these are the criteria for green two kg CO two per one kg of hydrogen production, and in green grey hydrogen, ten kg of CO two. Per one kg of hydrogen production, nodal agency are the Bureau of Energy Efficiency (BEE) under the Union Ministry of Power is the nodal agency. Remember, the BEE is the nodal agency of green hydrogen, responsible for accrediting agencies for monitoring, verifying, and certifying green hydrogen production projects. So, BEE is the nodal agency responsible for accreditation, monitoring, verifying, certifying green hydrogen projects. Okay, 
and this BE come under Ministry of Power. So you can clearly see this green hydrogen initiative is very important for the development and also combating you know, you can say environment pollution and climate change. So this is all about part three of the December 2023. And through this, we are completed the all the lectures of December 2023. And in the next discussion, I solved all the question, 100 to 120, whatever the number are. I solved all the question because I uploaded part one, two, three. Today I uploaded part four and in part five, we solve all the questions so that you can revise each and every question through the question and answer format. So I hope you love this discussion, you enjoy this discussion, gain some perspective, some knowledge out of it. So keep learning, keep growing. Uh, from now onwards, I try to upload each and every video of January and February as soon as possible. I just, uh, I, I said earlier, I stuck in some problems, some you can say problems. Uh, I try to modify my way of teaching so that you can grasp more and more from this discussion. So I hope you understand my concerns and uh, do not, you can say, disappoint by not uploading video very earlier. So I hope you forgive me and gain your knowledge from these videos. So keep learning, keep growing. Namaskaram. Thank you.